Hello, hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Discussing Tabletop for July 1st, 2017. It's episode 35. Welcome. Uh, we, of course, have our unillustrious guest here of Charlotte. Uh, unfortunately, our guest of Samat can't join us this week, but he will be rescheduling for another week upcoming. He had to cancel out at last second. Uh, you know, just um, some scheduling mess up between the two of us that... Um, I didn't realize daylight savings time, you know, the difference changed between us and Europe. Because they don't have that. I never. Ah, mm -hmm. I never thought about that either. See? Uh, well, some parts do. A lot uh, of parts do, actually. So. Well, apparently, it, it, where he was in the UK did not have it. Ah, well. Mm -hmm. So, all right, though. But we have an, a great docket today. Um beginning with we will talk a little bit more about magic uh the full spoilers of our devastation is out i just want to briefly go over that i mean we've talked about a lot of them uh we'll just see what's uh everything that's left of them you know just kind of go over them briefly there is a few more interesting things i did see i do want to talk about the state of magic tournaments as it is because we have uh charlotte here who is a magic judge because then we'll talk about uh being a magic judge with charlotte uh, we'll move on to talking a little bit about D&D Beyond, because they have had some updates, which uh, Joe has been looking into. And then we'll, we'll talk about the Discworld RPG, which has gotten a latest edition with the updates of GURPS. And finally finish off with talking a little bit about Dicebot and Megafun. Before we go to our normal segments, stories from the table, and gaming sage advice. But why don't we begin, of course... With some more hours of devastation. I know, it just seems like we keep talking about this, but they keep talking. For hours. <laughs> For hours. Well, I mean, we will until it's actually out. One of those things. Uh, so, apparently, um, horse tribal is a thing now. There's a crested sun mare. Where other horses you control have indestructible. At the beginning of your turn... You create a 5-5 five, five horse token. <laughs> Alright! I didn't know we needed horse tribal, but apparently someone thought we did. Well, you only get the horse if you gained life, but yeah. <laughs> okay, that's true. And it's yeah. at each end step, not oh, it's beginning each end of your step. turn. Oh, I missed that, the each end step. Uh, yep. No one ever expects horse tribal. No, no one ever <laughs> expects horse tribal. It's, it's just one of those weird things that... Um, I mean, it looks nice. Yeah. I, I I just don't know about like the existence of horse tribal beyond there. Yeah. It feels weird that it's tied to life gain, but doesn't have like life link or anything. You know, I or just... any way to actually gain life with it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's one of those things. Uh, you know, I, um, I could see uses for it, though, too. I mean, oh, yeah. definitely. But, I mean, horse tribal. Like, the cat, tri the cat tribal I could see before as something. Yeah, there's really not a whole lot of horses in Magic, and very few white ones, but it could be fun. I mean, yeah. Works Definitely. well with changelings, if nothing else, but so does every lord. So. so does everything. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Well, let's see what else we have here that really stands out for me. I have to remember everything, because I did look through some of this stuff. But, you know, my memory, it's rusted steel trap. Definitely. Is it rusted shut or rusted open? Um, probably oh. shut? Probably a third of the way open or something, where it's like, you can wiggle through, but it's uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, this is accurate. <laughs> uh, oh. Uh, I do like, I do like a Cursed Horde. I don't know if that's been, uh, it was out a little longer. The zombie one where you can give them indestructible. But that's just me, because I do use zombies in some of my decks, so. Um. Uh, so, I mean... I think we've been we said it before in other weeks that they do have a seemingly large tribal theme going on uh, mm -hmm. to fix and and, it, and I think that we we it sounds like the only information we have like about the new commander is it's going to be tribal 
and it sounds like there's going to be tribal in um Ixalan. Yeah, my god, I blanked out on that for a second. I'm really blanking out today very well. Hey, what kind of grand is it? Uh pricks. Or wait. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Pre <laughs> Oh, wow. Man. You caught me on it. I did it again. Uh, I mean, I do like how they also seemingly have zombies in a lot of different colors now, too. Which is an interesting fact. Because we had blue and black before, now we had white with a monquette. But we can see that there's, like, red now, too. Rainbow uh, zombie. Yeah. I never thought about having rainbow zombies, but I guess it's a thing now. <laughs> No green zombies, though. Yeah, I guess that's one of those things that they... It should, be, it should be some kind of plant zombie. That actually sounds like something that could exist in somewhere. Exactly. I mean, there, there, there are some of those back on, like, Ravnica, but that's a while back. Yeah, it's true, because they were the green-black, you know. So, they did do some of those. Uh, so, I guess you could have your rainbow zombies. Woohoo! Rainbow zombie! Yeah. <laughs> uh... Yep, I don't think anything, like, other than, like, the horse travel really stands out for me for this week. Uh, uh, the Godfarrow's Gifts is pretty interesting, where you can exile creatures to get 4-4 four, four black zombie versions of them with haste. Um, ba -ba 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 ba 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 Well, you know, again, we've, uh, managed to talk a lot about these. Uh, oh, uh, uh, it's, it's plants versus zombie, Joe. Plants versus zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Not plant zombies, sorry. Well, maybe a plant... Well, what about those um, fungi that can infect ants and ter effectively turn them into zombies? So we're doing Last of Us now? Last of Us in Magic well, the Gathering? Well, it's a real thing, too. I know it's a real thing, too. But... So then, then you can have a plant zombie. Uh-huh, uh-huh. There are actually six plant zombies in Magic, and five of them are from Ragnica. So. <laughs> oh, there was a sixth one that wasn't from Matt Raptica. Nope, there was one that was in Eventide for some reason. All right, I don't know. Well, Eventide had a lot of interesting things in it, so yeah. I can. I, can, uh... I mean, the the flavor makes sense. It it's like a black creature that eats, that exiles cards in graveyards, and you gain life. So yeah, that's sort of a green yeah. thing. So, yeah. There you so, go. So I mean. You theoretically could make a plant zombie deck if you really wanted to. Um, With a, a really terrible one, but sure. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you could. It would be really bad. <laughs> Just because you can. That's why. Yeah, I mean... I mean uh, well, I, I guess it's not that bad. It's kind of missing a two drop, but yeah. Um, I guess, so let's see. It, so, so you have... You have a one drop, you have two three drops, a four drop, a f and two five drops. So yeah, that's not terrible, I guess. Yeah, and if you, like, get some kind of way, like an artifact maybe to put cards into an opponent's graveyard, uh, yeah. it helps with the vulture zombie. Um, oh yeah, exactly. And then you can eat those cards with the Creekwood Ghoul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, there is uh, definitely some... Some so okay, <laughs> we've gone off into building a plant zombie deck. <laughs> eh, I mean, I well, mean couple... at the very least, we, you could be, build an official rainbow zombie deck. Okay, rainbow that's true. Zombie. Yep, you can build a rainbow zombie. Zombies have rainbow pride, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're into gay zombies. Uh, hey, look, zombies are free to make their life choices as much as they want as anyone else. Mm -hmm. Hopefully right. their hearts fall off. Well, I mean, they're zombies, so you never know what the state of zombies are. So, I mean, uh, it might be platonic love. We don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, that okay. This is gone. Okay, this conversation's <laughs> gone really, really weird, uh, really quickly. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's move away You're from welcome. this. Um... <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, it would technically be an unlife choice. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. 
good on Tish. <sighs> All right. Let's talk about the state of tournaments. Let's move away from this because this is conversations going really weird. And uh, Moquette, it's definitely opened up an interesting bunch of things. Uh, I have seen, you know, with like a lot of interesting tribal and definitely some cards I do like in there. So we'll, we'll leave it off at that. We've talked about a lot of the major ones before. So, uh... So, I haven't been to any of the large tournaments. As I've, I've said, I've been to pre-releases, and yep. I've, been, I've been to a pretty big pre-release back in the day. It was like a regional um, apocalypse tournament. So, it was like right. uh, like 50 to 100 people. Yeah. But I haven't been to any of the big Grand Prix. Did I just do it again? No, no you didn't. did it right. I did it right. You oh actually said it right. It wasn't I'm easy second to guessing the Grand myself. Pricks. I'm second guessing myself. <laughs> I'm second guessing myself. For some reason, he loves saying grand pricks. I'm bad with, I'm bad with language. I did not. It's it's uh, whatever. Anyway, how make words good? <laughs> exactly. How make words good? Me bad words. Uh, oh God. Uh, I don't even know what's going on in chat. Oh, um, so you were talking about <laughs> yes, tournaments. Uh, sparkle tournaments. fires. Um. It's interesting to see how they're evolving today because, like, we just had Grand the Grand Prix pre pre the Grand Prix Las Vegas, which people were saying was almost like a Magic the Gathering convention instead of like one of the normal tournaments, which mm -hmm. was very interesting take on it. While we do have still a lot of the actual tournaments, which are more tournaments in the sign of it, so how is this entire thing evolving? Is my first question um well i mean you have to realize that uh gp vegas and things like that are still like far outside the norm i mean gp vegas was the first time they've ever tried anything that's more than three days like your normal grand prix they have like you know last chance trials and some other tournaments on fridays and then they have the main event saturday and sunday the side events all weekend so that's your normal grand prix but vegas went six days i wasn't there so i'm not too sure but i think it like went from what like wednesday a to sunday yeah wednesday i think some people that. were sort of there on tuesday because uh yeah. some of the people i follow on twitter went there so it was sort of like okay yeah, but. like I mean, there, 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 there's. Well, I mean, I'm sure they were setting up the hall and stuff on Tuesday and yeah, stuff. So I mean, some judges worked six days, which is kind of insane. Um. Anyway, but yeah, so I mean, that is still far outside the norm. Like that's yeah. the closest thing we've ever had to that before. Were like the previous GP Vegas and Modern Masters weekends, where there are just enormous Grand Prixs. Yes. in various places and again i'm sure these things are going to be this is not going to be the norm mm -hmm. like a nor your normal grand prix is going to be the thing but in general grand prix have been getting bigger over the last few years though your average grand prix is still not going to be more than like 1500 people in the main event like it's it, you get you have a couple of grand prix a year that are like two thousand players or more. It's not we're not like every where everyone is that, and there's still a fair number that are like under around or under a thousand. So I mean, there's still some very reasonable sized ones, so people shouldn't feel intimidated to be like, oh well, I don't want to go. So there's going to be a bajillion people at this event. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. um so yeah. Okay. I was gonna say like um. It does seem to be, like, in until I, you know, was doing work on my channel here, I did not realize there was many as many of these tournaments across the world as there are, too. They're, oh, yeah. like, the... all over. Oh, yeah. There's GPs most weekends. A lot of times there'll be, like, two or three GPs in the same weekend. I know Wizards has been doing that a lot more in the past couple of years, uh, especially, like, this year, they've been definitely trying to theme. They'll, like, focus and have all the GPs on one weekend be the same format. I... Like, I know, um, basically, I think there were, like, only nine modern GPs this year. Mm -hmm. And I think 
two of them were like six of them were on two weekends where there were three modern gps on the same weekend all over the world and then i think there's two on the same weekend and then one random one because it that got moved or something anyway but yeah they're they're basically yeah. overlapping them a lot because it helps it lets them do like you know coverage and theme their thing because so you don't want to be like reading coverage about you know standard in you know like boston and then oh but then they're playing modern over in like japan and yeah you know it's completely different they want someone that's been hooked on coverage of you know tournament x to be able to easily tune in to tournament Y and not have to have a, a steep learning curve again or whatever. Yeah, definitely. And I I have found it very interesting because you do have like the mixture of definitely standard, limited, all this stuff. Um, it seems like it's... Uh, it seems like it's going in a good direction? I I, yeah. I don't know if that's to say. Like, is it... Is, you think it would be going in a good direction with the way they're going with tournaments? I think it's... Like, the larger tournaments, yeah, they're headed in a good direction right now. Um, I mean, from the player standpoint, things are going to be pretty good next year because uh, starting next year, uh, Channel Fireball Events is going to be running every Grand Prix all over the world. Like, so there's going to be a lot more consistency in what is offered at a Grand Prix and mm -hmm. what sort of side events there are, uh, how, how it's set up, what you know, the general sort of flow of the weekend is going to be the same um, or more, a lot more uniform and it's probably going to increase the production value since you know, there's not going to be like, you know, 20 different tournament organizers each having to figure this all out on their own where rather than have one that knows how to do it and does it, you know, at, at, at consistent quality week in and week out. Yeah. So standardization uh, on, is coming along. Yeah, yeah. On on the back end, there are some judges that are a bit concerned about what this means for the judge program and opportunities to judge. But again, at, at this point, we don't know any of those answers. And generally, things, if, even if, I mean, no matter if things get better or worse, it's probably not going to be any sort of significant change. So no matter what. You know, things are probably going to be fine overall. People just like to worry when things are changing and there's, and they, you know, there's no clear answer of whether, of how it's going to be at the end of it all. Yeah. Yeah. But from, again, from the player's standpoint, it should end up <coughs> better and more consistent. And, yeah. you know, if you go to Grand Prix X and have a good time, you should be able to go to Grand Prix Y, you know, three months and 2,000 miles later and, you know, still be able to have the same sort of good time. Yeah. Okay. Same sort of offerings. So, yeah. So, it, it, it seems like at least uh, the standardization does have a small advantage even though, yes, there is some questions about it, which I can understand yeah. there's always, like, yeah. questions about these well, things. Well, I mean, again, and also there's, you know, anytime you give someone a monopoly on something... There's, you know, concerns. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the thing is we're already all playing a game made by one company, so it's already a monopoly in its own way. And, yeah. you know, it's really not... It's not like... You know, I don't know. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're it's perfectly... It's true. It's uh, We're all playing Magic anyway, which Wizards yeah. is giving uh, making for us. So it's we're already along the same lines of... Uh, it, it's already one group controlling it anyway. It's just that now they're giving one group control of, well, the basics of tournaments. But it is a group yeah. that does them well, so it is... Yeah, exactly. And and the thing is, there's going to be, you know, t these TOs don't run... Like, if a TO runs a tournament and it, the players don't like it, they're not going to come and pay and play, and... Yeah. Then they start to lose money, and so people are go they're going to do things that players like, and that keep players coming back. Like that's basic economics. Exactly. So definitely looks like uh, Magic has been doing some interesting things with its tournaments because it does seem like it's at least got a good focus on them, and 
though I do have to say, uh, though again, I, I don't know if I'd be able to go to one. I do, I do miss, like, seeing one that might say, like, vintage or legacy there. <laughs> At least modern exists. I know I have, like, one or two modern decks I could play if I really wanted to go to one of these, you know, and participate. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I mean, again, the the vast majority of them is going to be are going to be standard or sealed deck because that those are the more accessible formats that more of the audience can play. But they still do support, you know, modern and and legacy, not yeah. so much vintage, of course. But yeah, yeah, well, you know. And then uh, there's other com and then there's other uh, companies like Star City that are supporting uh, those formats as well, especially mm -hmm. in the United States. Um, <laughs> And I mean, even in Europe, there are good, there are great organizations like Bazaar of Moxen that run really good like uh, eternal format events. Yeah. And so I mean, there you know, there's the demand for them. So there's people that run these events, even if it's not necessarily a GP. Yeah. So you can always find a good event out there. It, it's it's oh yeah. It's the event the events that are out there do exist. So you know, if you want to yeah. participate in one of these, you can definitely find one. Yeah, it's just again the the more niche the format, the farther you might need to go from home to find it. But that, I mean, that's part that's of true. the fun of part <laughs> of the fun of it, right? Yeah, traveling long distances to some place to do something. I I I know the feeling. It's uh it's always fun. But uh, why don't we move on a little bit though? To because we did bring up judges, and you're yep. a judge. So <gasps> I am. I know. <laughs> so why don't you? Why don't we start with what is what what kind of things do you do as a judge? That's a good way of starting it. Um, well, the uh, let's be fair. The J and judge is for janitor. Um, so a lot of judges do a lot of just the grunt work that needs to be done at tournaments: pushing in chairs, picking up trash, putting up, posting papers, you know, handing out match slips, all sorts of you know fun menial stuff that isn't glamorous at all that needs to be done to keep the tournament. Running. Yeah. Um, but then, on a more specific level, judges are there uh, to facilitate oh. the tournament running well, uh, to you know arbitrate disputes, you know answer calls, answer rules questions, basically help players have a fun and fair event. Yeah. And make sure that the tournament is fun and fair for everyone. Yep. I, I have heard some, like, I interesting uh, talk more as of late that, like, it's, it's people should definitely give good respect to the judges. You know, it's like, when you're calling on them, you're not, it's, oh, no, it's like, make sure you call on them. Uh, you know, because it's like, oh, yeah. it's not that, you know, someone's calling you out on, you know, maybe cheating or something. It's they want to make sure the rules are being done right, you know. But mm -hmm. I think that's one of those things about tournaments sometimes that... It seems to be a problem, a little bit of one, but I guess uh, some people got angry about it or something, which seems dumb to me, but whatever. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, it could be more of a regional issue as well, but in general, if you're at a tournament, like, and something goes wrong, even if it's F&M, even if it's, you know, yeah. Wednesday night draft at your local store, like... If there's a judge there, call the judge. Judges are there to help fix things. Like, yeah. you don't just call a judge if you think someone's cheating. You call a judge if, you know, there's a oh, problem. I accidentally drew two cards and didn't realize, and now it's two turns later. Like, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Right? Or, yeah. or, you know, or, oh, I cast this draw spell and I didn't have the right mana, but these three cards are already in my hand, and, you know, like... Or, yeah. you know, I mean, just... Problems that happen. Stuff. Or, you know, yeah. this creature was supposed to die and it didn't, you know. I mean, anything like that. And, you know, if, if you think your opponent... I mean, there are times where it is more uh, confrontational, where, you know, someone does suspect their opponent is cheating or doing something shady, or, you know, or if they think their opponent's playing slowly, or, you know, and I mean, judges are trained to help deal with that as well. And, you know, yeah, they're not everything is honest. It's not always honest mistakes, but I mean, you know, we do our best to f catch the players that are making those not so honest mistakes and, you know, make sure that they're not ruining the tournament for anyone else for the rest of the day. Yeah. So. Uh, so now here's a, here's a question I have. What was the process for you to become a judge? 
Uh, the process for me to become a judge is not super... I mean, it's not that different, but I became a judge, like, it'll be eight years and, like, a week, so it's been, it was a long time ago, so mm -hmm. the process has changed a fair amount in that time, but the basics of it are the same. The basics of it are, step one, find a level two or level three judge in your area, talk to them, basically meet with them if you can, or talk online, whatever, uh, you know, basically help, basically figure out, you know, let, let them know you're interested in judging, they'll tell you a bit more about what it means to be a judge, and what you can do to help out in your community, and that sort of stuff, then you go and you basically be a judge at a couple of events it does they don't have to be competitive events they can just be like, again your wednesday night draft your fnm your pre-release your whatever mm -hmm. as long as you're there helping out then it counts and once you've done a couple of those if the judge that you've been working with thinks you're ready they can basically sit you down and they give you a a multiple choice test with about 25 I think yeah 25 questions for level one um, and if you get a passing score on that which is like 72 percent or higher um, that and you they don't have any concerns about you as a judge then hey you're now a judge um, there are also obviously becoming a judge means you're agreeing to be bound by the judge code of conduct, which is just a very basic, like, don't be a dick. Don't let other people in your communities be dicks to other people, you know, yeah, just, just general, don't just general make environments welcoming and friendly, you know, don't use your powers as a judge for evil, that sort of thing. Um, yes. yeah. Cool. Now you're a level three judge. What does that Perfect. mean? Because you were you were mentioning level two, level three, and level one. Right. You know. Okay. So levels. Uh, there used to be more levels. There used to be five levels of judge. But a couple, is it a couple years ago now? I'm not sure. Like year and a half, two years ago, they changed that, and now there's only three levels. Um. So easiest if I just start from the beginning. So a level one judge is a local judge. They're a judge that helps out at their local store. Mm -hmm. They're like the rules person or the community person in their local store. They answer questions. Yeah. They maybe help the store run tournaments. Maybe they're a store employee. Maybe they're not. But they're the guy at your local store. They're not expected to travel anywhere else or judge anything else. They might want to help with competitive, but it's not at all required. They have a good knowledge of the rules, but they're not by no means necessarily rules experts. They know how to fix basic situations, and they're focused on, like, casual and regular tournaments. They're not focused on competitive tournaments where you need deck lists and there are official penalties and that sort of thing. Um, a level two judge, on the other hand, is a judge that is trained to work at competitive tournaments. They're trained to work at larger events uh, in... A little farther from home uh, they know how to deal with the official penalties they know how to work as part of a team larger team of judges uh, level two judge can certify new level one judges uh, through the process I described earlier um, level two judges can work at Grand Prix and level two judges you know they're sort of the backbone of the program, at least as far as bigger events like Grand Prix and, you know, PPTQs and such are concerned. Okay. A level three judge is basically someone that is certified and proven to be able to be a leader of level two judges. They're the judges that lead teams at Grand Prix. They head judge larger tournaments like nationals and regional pro tour qualifiers and that sort of stuff. There are also the judges that head judge uh, GPs and Pro Tours and stuff, but that's a special separate uh, Grand Prix head judge certification. And there's only like a tiny handful of, the, of those people. Um, but yeah, basically level three judges can also advance level one judges to level two. Um, their level three judges are really trained in how to do really deep investigations and 
they're they're the judges that really drive the judge program uh, in helping to develop its philosophy and policies and keep it all running. Okay. So that's sort of the role that you take on. Does this yeah. mean you've actually like led some GPs? Uh, well, I'm, I haven't head judged a GP. I'm not you haven't a head Grand Prix head ch- I haven't You're not a Grand Prix. No, but I mean, okay. but I've led teams like okay. on, at a Grand Prix or a larger tournament. There are a bunch of different teams doing different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a very basic team breakdown at a large event is going to be you're going to have a team that handles... Like, again, there's all sorts of things that need to be done in a tournament. A very typical sort of breakdown at sort of a medium-sized event, like, a, say, a 200-player event, is you'll probably have a paper team that handles posting pairings, giving out match slips. Um, you'll have a deck check team that makes sure that you have all your deck lists and deals with actually checking the decks to make sure people are playing what they registered. Mm-hmm. And then you'll have a logistics team which handles setting up the room at the beginning of the day, making sure that if it's, say, limited, everyone gets their product, um, making sh- you know, and then that the trash from that's put back away, making sure that there are deck lists for everything. You know, um, and then once the event is running, their job is basically to, you know, put out any fires as they arise. Um, and then in, on top of all of this, of course, there's a head judge. Um, as your events get bigger, like Grand Prix, you, you sort of more specialize the teams. Sometimes you'll have separate slips teams and, you know, postings teams. You'll have a, a team that's just responsible for making sure there's good floor coverage. You'll have a team that's responsible for handling the end of round procedure to make sure that there's judges on every table when time is called and people are watching tables with time extensions and all that sort of stuff to keep the tournament running. Like, because losing time is the worst thing that can happen at a tournament because, you know, no one wants to be waiting like 30 minutes between rounds just because, you know, one table's playing slowly or no one knew they had a time extension or whatever. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I've led those sorts of teams at Grand Prix of different sizes. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so do you travel a lot with your uh, status as uh, a judge? I travel a reasonable amount. I mean, I'm by no means, like, a super jet setter. There are some people that are traveling to, like, there are level two and level three judges that work, you know, like 18 to 20 plus GPs a year. And that's kind of crazy if you ask me, but I mean, I'm usually working, um, in the past few years, I've been doing about, I'd say about six to eight GPs a year, which is a good number for me. Um, as well as, uh, judging head judging some of smaller events, but still very important events like regional pro tour qualifiers and, you know, other larger competitive, other sort of medium-sized competitive events, like just big legacy tournaments and stuff that happens more locally. Well, um, how, yeah. How, what's the farthest you've traveled for one of them? Um, well, okay, so I am Canadian, but I currently live in Finland. Um, but, like, if you're talking, like, actual just travel time, um... When I went to judge Pro Tour uh, Kaladesh in Honolulu in October, that was a really long travel that took basically more than 24 hours each way with all the layovers and everything. Yeah, Yeah, it was insane, but so worth it. I don't know if you guys have been to Hawaii, but it's amazing. I have not. That's one of the places (laughs) I do want to go to. We have a friend who did cru- um, who was on uh, was a photographer on cruises for Hawaii, and I've seen a lot of beautiful pictures. Oh yeah, no, Hawaii is amazing. If you can go, you owe it to yourself to go, because like there's just it. You can see pictures, but it until you're there, you don't got it. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, Joe, do you have any questions? Because before I continue on, just because you've been, you know, not really. <laughs> Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I just wanted to make sure that you didn't have anything because I I do want to cover all the bases just in case. So, um, we got kind of an idea of what it is to become a judge and your experience. Um, would you suggest it for people? 
I'd suggest it for people if they think it's something they'd enjoy. Like, if you really like the rules, if you feel you have a knack for the rules or for, you know, helping to solve people's problems, if you like helping people have fun. Um, Like, for me, one of the big reasons I got into judging is that... Like, I, I just love magic. Like, the game is amazing, and it's been a part of my life for, like, just years and years and years and years and years at this point. But I know I'm never going to be, you know, that high-caliber player. I'm never going to be the kind of person that can, you know, get that Pro Tour invite as a player. And But I wanted to be involved with the game at, you know, that sort of competitive level and becoming a judge was a really good way for me to you know channel that impulse and be able to do that without you know just banging my head against a wall and being frustrated all the time and like you know i mean there there's a lot of people i know that say oh i'd love to be a judge someday but right now i like to focus on playing and like hey that's great you know the judge program is going to be here for you whenever you you know, decide to stop playing as much, you know, we're happy to, I mean, we need, we want people to, we don't want anyone to feel like they have to judge because no one else will. Like that's, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, this is like, it's not volunteering because, you know, people are making money, but it's, you know, it's a side gig. It's not a job, you know, with the exception of a very few people that work for companies like Star City or Channel Fireball or whatever. Okay. You know, you you don't you, you become a judge because you want to. You don't you shouldn't because I'm a judge because you feel like you have to. Like, okay, you know, it's not your job. It's it's something you do because you want to do it. That was another thing I was thinking about. Is are you flown out to some of these places, or do you have um, to pay your own way to some of them? Or well, I mean, when you work larger events, the only time you're ever actually like you ever actually have your flight specifically covered is if you're judging on the pro tour or if you're like a head judge of a GP. Mm -hmm. Um, In those cases, you're specifically contracted directly with wizards and they pay you a, uh, you know, a fee that is very clearly to cover your travel and, um, you know, hotel and all expenses and, but if you're judging something like a Grand Prix or whatever, you're basically just paid a daily rate, which is a lot less than you would get from Wizards for judging a Pro Tour or whatnot. Okay. Um, and, you know, that it's then up to you. You're paid a daily rate, and then you get some, you know, sealed product and whatever, and it's up to you as a judge to figure, does this make sense for me financially? And obviously, like, it's not going to make sense financially for a judge to go judge a GP, you know, an ocean away, you're not going to come out ahead on that balance sheet, right? You're going to get a nice subsidized trip, but you're not going to be making money. You're just going to be spending less on your travel, Mm. basically. Um, But at the same time, a judge that's judging a GP, you know, like an hour away from home, and gets a reasonably cheap hotel and or whatever. Yeah, they they should they should you know feel like they've been fairly compensated for their time and come out, you know, ahead enough that you don't feel like you've been doing like slave labor or whatnot. Okay. But again, you know, like, you don't ex. Whereas you know, like don't expect to go judge a GP and, you know, be rolling in cash. You yeah. don't. You you know. Yeah. I mean, ideally, the trip should pay for at least pay for itself. But you know, yeah, gotcha. Some people, some people don't do that. Whereas, if you go judge a pro tour for Wizards and they contract you, you definitely come out ahead on the on the deal. Like, you know, you you get a nice trip and you get money on top of it. So, yeah, you feel like you know you've made reasonable money on top of what they pay you on top of what your travel would cost you. Cool. Yeah, that's actually yeah. really interesting. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alicia. <laughs> it's people are making fun of my ability to uh, pronounce words again. So, no, that's very cool. Um, 
definitely is interesting. That was another one of those things I was thinking about, is, like, the expenses to get there, and, like, it's interesting that, yeah, it, it's one of those things you will get some something for, but, yeah, it's definitely, I find it, you know, it's not a job, which I do like. That's a good definement of it, that, you know, it's just something to do on the side, and right. I think that's what some people should recognize when thinking about it. Definitely cool. Yeah. Uh, Alright, I think I've pretty much handled all the important questions about uh, being a judge. Is there anything else you wanted to say about it before we moved on? Um, just, uh, I just would like to say that, like, the judge program is amazing. It's full of, like, amazing people, and I've made so many friends being a judge, and it's just, it's just such a great experience. It's such a great way to plug into not only just the wider magic community, but into this group of really cool, really smart, really weird and awesome people. And, like, if it's something that seems at all interesting to you, you know, give it a try. Like, you could, you're not, you don't ha you're not, like, locked in for life if you become a judge and don't like it. You can just not judge and then you're not a judge anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, so give it a try if it's something you think you'd like. You know, I mean, worst case scenario, you learn the rules a little better. Like, True. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, all right. Why don't we move on, though, because there was a couple more topics I want to handle. Why don't we start with one that uh, hopefully, Joe, you can, uh, you've can you been reading up on a little bit more. So another product of Wizards, Dungeons & Dragons, because Wizards does like these two major games. <laughs> Thank you, Wizards yep. of the Coast. Um, D and D Beyond is their new like website slash app they've been working on for Dungeons and Dragons, and apparently it's been updating. Joe, you've been looking at it. Yes, over. Um, they're moving through two phases two and three of the beta testing. Okay, they've unlocked. Um, now you can see other people's uh, homebrew stuff. Okay, you can create up to six characters in there. Uh, and they have the full rules listings of, in the basic books. Okay. Uh, for the characters, do you see if, let's say, like, would you be able to get rid of one and then make a new one? Or is it just you have three lifetime? I That I'm not 100% sure on. I haven't uh, tested that out. Okay. Um, but they have made some uh, big announcements. One, they have made an agreement with Twitch. Mm -hmm. Which uh, you're, they're going to be... Integrating D&D um, &D Beyond with Twitch. Okay. Which I think is a major thing. Um, it, you'll be able to, like, if you're watching a live stream on Twitch, you'll be able to hover over a character and see, like, what effects are on them and things of that nature. That's pretty cool. So I think that's going to be a great tool. Um, they have come out that they are going to be, uh, once the full product's released, there is going to be three tiers. Mm-hmm. You, there's going to be a free, uh, free tier, and it's basically going to be what the beta is now. You, you, know, you have six characters. You can create up to six characters. You'll be able to port them into Twitch, which mm -hmm. is nice. Um, that, uh, then, and you'll have the basic stuff. You can, you'll be able to purchase books and then have access to those materials. They haven't come out with the prices yet, but they said they will soon. Mm -hmm. um, and they will be digital prices. It won't be the price, you know buying the full book yes um then there's going to be a second tier i think they call it the heroic tier which um gives you unlimited character building and then there's going to be a top tier which unlocks extra content and it's really good for dms because if they buy if they're top tier and they buy a book they can share it with up to 12 people per game they're running Okay, that's cool. So that's really big. And another thing that they're doing with it, which I think is going to be a great GM tool, is going to be, um, there's going to be uh, monster scaling. You can actually level up monsters. Okay, so that's you helpful. Want, yeah, exactly. If you want, you know, if you take a basic monster, but you want it to be a higher challenge rating to fit somewhere in between in an adventure, like say, th their example was like, say you have a, you're fighting mages and before you fight that big arch mage you want something between there that's still like a mage 
you could level up a lower a regular mage to scale it to that adventure. So I think that's going to be a major tool, and that's going to be in, integrated with Twitch, which is amazing. So do you know much about how the Twitch integration works, or have they just said they're integrating it and they've given some examples? They've given examples. Um, I don't know 100% how the integration works. It hasn't officially happened yet. They've announced that it's going to. Okay. So I, I think that'll be a great thing to uh, keep an eye out. It's, you know, obviously, it's going to be for all the 5th edition and the book, sh the whole book sharing thing is great because everyone can chip in with the DM to buy a book for their game and be like, hey, now we all have access to it. Yeah. If, a... if the GM wants to get the top subscription. <clears throat> yes. Interesting. So definitely it looks like D&D Beyond's going in a good direction for now. Yeah, there, it's um, another company that's working with uh, Wizards called um, Curse. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are actually developing all this. They they made a deal with um, wizards to do all this, and their main focus their you know main focus on this is for um, cutting down on time for people doing you know, for rules and setup and stuff like that. That things are going to be more automated, that, uh, especially for online play. And they don't have the app out yet, do they? But they're planning no, on it? No, the app's not out yet. This is the last um, part of the beta test still. Mm -hmm. But the, the next step, I believe, is going to be the app uh, release. Right now, they because they went from to part one of the beta test and now fully went part two and three right away. They didn't even do you know two and then three. They just finished the beta testing out. Wow. Uh, they said they've gotten great responses from people. They've gotten great ideas. The homebrew sections actually has a lot of information. Oh, and that's the other thing. If you're a free subscriber, you can create homebrew stuff and use it, but you won't be able to share it with everyone. If you're a tier two or tier three subscriber, then you'll be able to actually share it with the community as well. But will you be able to look at the homebrew stuff if you're a free subscriber? Yes. Okay. Everything that's in the beta now, they said, is going to be in the free subscription. Okay. Cool. So you're still going to get a lot of free stuff, even just being a free subscriber. The main thing is if you're playing, if you plan to use a lot of characters, then you know, you might want to be looking at paying at least the level one, the level two subscription fee, because then you can create unlimited amount of characters. All right. That's definitely. <clears throat> an interesting one cool good to know uh all right is there anything else you want to talk about with this one oh well, we covered it mostly that was pretty good information yeah, I, about I, I think yeah i think we covered all the major uh things that they released on it they did have a uh, youtube video explaining uh, all of that um if you search D, &D beyond you on youtube i'm sure you'll find it mm-hmm uh that's where i got some of this information and then some of it was just scouring the web and stuff but I think this is really exciting, and I think it's going to be a great tool, and I'm looking forward to having some of this stuff um, integrated to Twitch for our game on Sundays. Yes, that'd be cool, definitely. <clears throat> All right, uh, the why don't we move on from topics still, because that was D&D Beyond, as it has been updated now. We've talked a little bit about it when it was first announced, and it seems like it's actually going in a good direction, because we were, I guess, worried about that a little bit, I thought, you know, that it was like... Well, yeah, we wanted to see, you know, what it was going to entail, if they were going to have any free stuff and everything like that, if it was, or if it was just going to be, end up being a pay, yeah. every, you know, for everything. And they are, they are leaving the beta as basically the free version. I'm, I'm guessing that stuff will be added into the app. And that, um, you know, there are tier versions. They haven't released those pricings yet, though, either. Okay. All right. Why don't we move on, though, and let's talk a little bit about the latest... I guess this is technically the latest version of the Discworld RPG. Uh, it's technically... I guess it has been, in the past, from, from the information I have, been a GURPS product. GURPS being the role-playing game system, which, uh, uh, if people are familiar, I have not played. I don't think you have played either, Joe. No, I think we've used some GURPS material in the past for D&D, and that's about it. Yes. So, it's the complete role-playing game for it, with updated rules, 4th edition GURPS. And it's Discworld. Uh, <laughs> you know a lot more about Discworld than me, don't you? I love Discworld. I love Terry Pratchett. May he rest in peace. Unfortunately, he's no longer around. Mm-hmm. 
but he, he, the universe that he created is a vast one and very imaginative. It's kind of basically a joke on the real world and, um, you know, going from everything, they have the incarnation of death who looks like the classic Grim Reaper skull, you know, bone guy with the Reaper with the uh, scythe, mm-hmm. who is a very interesting character. They they've done parodies on Phantom of the Opera. So it, it's a very immersive universe, uh, very British humor. So if you like British humor, it's definitely worth it. I would love to try the role playing game because it would be interesting just to dive into that world more. Well, it would be interesting also just to try out GURPS' system, because we haven't right. done that. Very true. And then, you know, then you also have the uh, main city, Ak Morpork. Mm-hmm. Which, you have a wizard's college that is rather demented. <laughs> you have a, a wizard who was turned into an orangutan, who is the librarian. And he wants to stay that way. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> So it, it, it's, it definitely would be an interesting thing to do. You could do a somewhat serious game with it, but I, I think it would also be great for, you know, more of a fun adventure kind of thing as well. So it feels like it's a little bit, just because of the imagination and the imaginative nature of it, it does feel like it would be a little bit more comical, though yes. maybe towing the line between the comical and the serious might be the best way of doing it, perhaps. Yes, I mean, you could do a total, you know, bizarre game and be off the walls, but you you could do a somewhat serious game with moments of uh, good comedy in there. Mm-hmm. Comedy drama. Drama. It's an actual thing. I, yes, I, I, know. I, I know, but it's still. Dramedy. Dramedy. Everybody likes a good dramedy. So, yeah. So this is, I believe, uh, based on the fourth edition of GURPS is out yes. now. Yes. Yep, uh, by Steve Jackson Games. Yeah, they've been previously... They've been updating things a lot. And, I mean, you could have gotten definitely 3rd edition from... I think th- they did 3rd edition 2 originally. Uh, uh, but that was... And new. I would... Oh, I was gonna say, I would say from what I'm reading here... Might as well just buy the hardcover, because it's only a $10 difference. Ah, Hard covers thirty nine ninety five. The PDF is thirty. Mm-hmm. So might as well spend the ten extra bucks and actually get a hardcover copy. Mm-hmm. I know it, we you you like a good hardcover and I do too. But sometimes you need a good PDF also. True, but for the price, that's why I'm saying it might be just better to buy the hardcover. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Discworld's out now. Maybe we will test it out at some point in time. We can put it on the list of ones to uh, maybe do some one-shot streams with or something. Maybe maybe you could run that one because you're more familiar with the universe. Oh, it's going to be crazy then. (laughs) Again, you're way more familiar with the universe than the rest of us anyway. You know most of the major players and characters and, like, locations and stuff. You just spouted stuff off there that I would not have known, you know, just from what I've... I, I, I've been a fan of Terry Pratchett for years. I've read a lot of the Discworld books. So I'm very familiar w- with their universe and how things kind of uh, work in it. Cool. All right, so Discworld out now. You can get it PDF or uh, physical copy. And yes. it does seem like a very interesting one. It's a big book, too, may we note. So, you know, if you're spending the 40, it's like a 400-page book. Hardcover. So it is like a big role-playing game book. And 40 is not bad for a role-playing game book of that size. No, 408 pages. Wow. that uh, The PDF's 411. They might have I... something else extra there or something. Or maybe, I... m- maybe they count the cover and back as pages when it comes to PDF. Oh, uh, maybe. But still, that's... One page still more. Don't <laughs> ask questions. I don't know. Bonus page. Bonus page. It's just a blank page with nothing on it. It's, like, it's just a page. You, you got or it maybe it's a, maybe it's a bonus page of artwork. You never know. Uh, that might be their incentive for getting the PDF. It's like you get some extra pages. Come on and join us. Get the electronic copy. Ooh, scandalous. Yep. All right. 
why don't we talk about the last major topic for today? I did want to talk a little bit about a new dice slash card game, Dicebot Mega Fun. So this one is really interesting. The ob the idea of it is your players are going to this junkyard, picking up robot parts, picking up weapons, throwing them together, and then you're having them battle each other out to I guess robot death, and uh, for your for your amusement and your victory. Uh, apparently you get six parts to your robot each time you build it. Uh, you're going to choose weapons, which is all kinds of weapons, from Uzis to lasers to rifles. And you have to win three combats to win. Uh, and you can have special abilities in advanced play that I guess they can unlock with special things. Um, so that seems it seems like an interesting one where... You take rounds trying to, I guess, build the best robot you can build, and then fighting it out. Yes. Robot war! It really kind of is this, like, a little, like, robot war thing, except you're customizing your own robot a bit each time. And I'm guessing it's, because of the nature of it, it's always, you're probably not going to fight with the same one each round, maybe? Yeah, I think you might have to rebuild your robot. Well, your poor robot might get beat up. I mean, come on, it's... Be the first robot to win three combats. Uh-huh. That's the question. Is it, it, it? Now, that's the question we don't know for this information here. Oh. Is it the same combat? Or is it the same robot three combats? Do you have... And you just have to get lucky on, like, dice rolls or something? Or... I'm not sure, but they, um, each, you can do it. There's two play, ways to play a regular mode, and then there's an advanced mode, which you get, are given a special ability that you can activate by kill points, which are gotten by dealing the final blow to ro robots in combat. So I'm assuming then it, if your robot survives, it can go on to the next combat, but if it's destroyed, you create a new one. Okay. So it's pretty much like you play it out that the one you all fight it out, and then the next person, like the one that wins, basically keeps and goes on while everybody else has a chance of countering that out. Yeah, and there's five body areas, and then uh, what, and then the head area. Yeah, so it sort of like breaks down what you have for your robot. Uh, yes, I want to. So I'm guessing leg, leg, arm, arm, and chest. Yeah, leg, leg, arm, arm, chest, head. Yeah. You know, and the weapons, like, I mean, the cards seem very simple but interesting, too, because it's like, they just have a, I guess you've got a bunch of stats, too, because it looks like each robot has six stats. Right, well, each stat would probably go to a body part, since there's well, six body parts. Well, if you look at the cards, which they have some pictures of it, well, I'll leave a link in the chat for folks that are in chat with us today. To the main site where they're... Oh, uh, they have... Um, on WizKids, they actually have the rules that you can download. So I'm going... I'm doing that now. And we will see if I can figure... Find out more about how the play goes. Oh, I didn't realize they had rules to, like, download. I probably would have, like, looked at these ahead of time if I... Re oh, there it is. I'm clicking Duh. it, but nothing's happening, so I don't know. Yeah, nothing's happening for me either. So I guess no, the fact that I, I guess you can't download the rules. I guess the fact I missed this big square that said "download rules" right in front of me as like not a problem. Uh, but it's not working, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, thirty-minute games, fourteen up ages. I guess you know it's got Uzi. It was just released this month. Yep, just came out. And as you said before, um, when we were talking about it before. You get all your stuff from the junkyard, which must be a military junkyard if you're getting bombs, Uzis. Rifles and lasers. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't think you normally build it out in a regular junkyard. <sighs> Apparently weapons have speed, direction of fire, damage, and a couple of special abilities. So I guess those are three of the main stats you have. Now okay. this does look like a very interesting game, uh, I do have to say. I definitely would like to try it out sometime. Too bad they don't have it on Tabletop Simulator, because that's the easy way to do it. Yes. Uh, but no, no. It, I mean, it's not too bad of a price, and it does look cool. Because uh, they have it at 25 was it? $25. US. Which is not bad. Uh, but no, Dicebot Megafun. It's, this definitely one looks like one to check out now. 
Um, I, I always like getting adding in like a good like card or board game to these to our segments here, just to you know because I mean we talk a lot about Magic and D and D and other not so much other card games and role and well some other role playing games, but you know this is a big part of tabletop games too that it's oh, always cool okay. to talk about. What what you found, Joe? What you found? Um, I found a page that actually goes o- gives a better overview. So each player is provided with a robot board, six weapon cards, six spare part dice. The robot card displays empty spaces to hold spare parts that will be used to equip various weapons over the course of six rounds of combat. Um, the dice are what actually go on to the card. Ah. So let's see. So maybe roll dice and figure out what you get and some things like that. Yeah, that's how you figure out what spare parts you have. Ooh, interesting. And so, then d- different car- um, cards require certain spare parts. Ah, so you might roll something that will give you this kind of weapon or this kind of, I guess, foot or something, you know. Yeah, you when a ch- player locates a spare part they need, they place it on the red storage squares of their robot card. Not only do you need to be quick about figuring out what you need, but it's imper- imperative that you recognize which parts will be in short supply and grab those before opponents does. The sixth dice selected is placed in the head of the robot and can be used as a, as a special power if the player chooses. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, so that's Dice Spot Mega Fun. It's out now if you want to check it out. Uh, it looks like a very cool little uh, card and board game. Uh, what well, card and dice game, I should say, you know. All right, why don't we move on to okay. our regular oh, segments? What, one what? quick last thing. So it looks like you roll all the dice at once. There's 24 <laughs> dice. And then everyone draws quickly from the pool. That, so that's why it's important to know what you need quickly. Ah. Uh, okay, so it's like a dice scramble game. That makes sense. Whoa. Yeah, that's why they said like, some things may be in short supply, depending on what you roll. Okay, so we're, it's, it's a scramble for the junk heap, basically, I guess? Yes. <laughs> cool. Cool. Good note. Let's move on to our two regular segments. Let's first start off with uh, one of my favorite segments, Stories from the Table, where I most of the time it's I go to my guests and I have them share some kind of story from their gaming table, whether it's from a role-playing game uh, which it could be a character, an adventure they ran uh, from a mag- from a collectible card game like Magic, where they had a really cool deck, or they had this awesome game, or even like as I've said, which no one has as of yet shared, an awesome session of a board game where it just went like something really cool happened during that board game. I love stories from the tabletop world. So, uh, Charlotte, do you have one that you can share with us today? Um. Well, it's not a specific story so uh-huh. much as it's the current standard deck I've been playing. That sounds and it's fun. Just, it's just it's a lot of fun. Um, so basically what it is... Um, hang on a second here. Uh, sorry. That's fine. I'll drop a link to the deck list in the Skype chat, and you guys can transfer that over to... uh... Joe, can you switch that over? Because I'll mess with the video if I try to get it. Thank you. Yeah, so anyway, the, 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 the whole point of this deck is it's like, I guess, Dredge is the closest analogy to it. It's get fun creatures in my graveyard, discard things, bring them back, and all at very unfair prices so it's just a lot of fun yeah basically i want to get stuff like haunted dead or ghoul steed into my graveyard to bring back you know free prized amalgams and discard things like fiery temper on the way there eventually my hand gets low i get to start swinging with hazaret and you know doing all sorts of crazy fun things that you really shouldn't be able to do in standard yeah no, that seems cool. Uh, no, I like a good deck. Uh, I, I don't have enough uh, good decks that do that kind of mechanics, is what I can yeah. say. Uh, and I like a good graveyard use deck, because, you know, that's just me. <laughs> 
Cool. No, I, uh, I'll probably try to link that on, uh, when I put out the, uh, VOD, uh, of this episode yeah. on, uh, YouTube. I'll try to, get, I'll put that twin t uh, picture for this cool, uh, deck that you've put together. That's definitely an awesome one. Uh, I, I said, you know, like, a, a good magic deck is always a wonderful thing to play. Yeah. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, why don't we finish up the segments for today with our last segment, uh, of course, uh, Gaming Sage Advice, which is a little segment where I like to have a single discussion question that relates to the tabletop gaming world answered to basically be advice to people. And it can take on a lot of different forms. Uh, generally speaking, I think it more ends up being, uh, I mean, we've taken on a lot of different forms for these questions, haven't we, Joe? Yes. I mean, we've had, like, philosophical... Pretty much anything you can think of. <laughs> we've had philosophical questions on this here, which is kind of weird, but we have. Uh, so, uh, chat, if you have a really good question you want to ask us, go ahead and ask us now. I will, of course, ask uh, Joe, Charlotte, if either of you have a question you think would be an interesting one to discuss, please let me know. If not, I will throw one that i kind of been considering with this... With our discussions that we've been having uh, now out there a little bit, um, which is a very interesting one. Um, so, if Joe, anything? Uh, not off the top of my head. That's fine. Um, uh, Charlotte, you have anything? No. Okay, great. That's fine. Uh, uh, so... Here's the question I have, which is an important one, which I thought about when we were talking about being a judge, which is what do we feel like is the, and this actually just applies more than just to magic. It would apply to a lot of gaming. Um, there's always seemingly someone that knows the rules more, but for the individual, what do we think like, what do we think is the best level for knowing about the rules? How far should we all dive into it? Just as a general person, what do we think is that level that we should go to? Which, it always seems like there is definitely, like, just knowing the basics. But, I feel like when we're talking about it, we should have people know more than just the basics. But, I can understand how people don't want to learn everything. Mm -hmm. So, this is an interesting one to discuss. So, I'll kind of lease off here. Um... <laughs> Because it's my weird question. <laughs> um, I kind of think, like, everybody should really just give at least a read-through on all the rules themselves. Even if you have, like, you know, even if you're not doing it for whatever game you're doing, at least give one read-through. You don't have to memorize everything. Just to give yourself yeah. a little bit of information about it, to know a little bit more about it. I mean, there are people that learn the rules by observing others which is a fine thing to do but i still feel like you should at least give the basic rules a read over yourself so that maybe you can pick up on some of these things occasionally and that again i know sometimes the rules can be very complex or large i know like magic's rules have gotten pretty large size because of all the years yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, they're called the comprehensive rules for a reason. They they have to be comprehensive. When the whole point of your game is that every card, yeah. you know, breaks the basic rules of what <laughs> the game does. Like, literally, that is the point of the game. Like, a card, cards do things, and yeah. the reason they do things is because those are not normal things that cards do, so... Like, outside of, like, vanilla creatures, everything is breaking the rules in yep. the game. So, it's definitely good to... Uh, is there, like, a sh like something shorter than the comprehensive rules? Like some... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, see, yeah, like... There... I don't know if it's still called... It was called the basic rule book at one point. Let me go to this and figure it out here. Magic. Don't use stuff. Um... Articles. Gameplay. Rules. Uh, yeah, there's a basic rules PDF 
like it's your introductory rules that tell you all about your um you know the basics of what cards do attacking and blocking yeah. and that sort of stuff um the, it's they're short they're like 10 pages I'll drop a link in uh, Skype again yeah if Joe you could pass that over yeah but... they haven't been updated since M15 apparently but like the basics of the game haven't changed yeah. since then so it's so fine that's something um, yeah oh if you want I mean I think anyone playing magic should probably know everything that's in there fairly well yeah true in the basic rules like you know Honestly, like, I run a uh, Tumblr blog where people ask me rules and policy questions and stuff, and the so many of my questions wouldn't need to be asked if people just had a more fundamental understanding about, like, priority in the stack, because that is at the, cr that is at the core of so many of the questions I get, like... You know, this all happens, what, how, how does it go on the stack, how does it resolve, like, well, if you understand, you know, about how triggers go on the stack, or if you understand about when you can respond to something or whatever, you know, that makes things a lot easier and less confusing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So... Definitely. And I don't think the basic rules explain it in that much detail, but there was a portion about like the stack and stuff so it's not like it's not mentioned yeah but there does seem to be definite level that people should at least be you should read through the basics and maybe there's like as you said the priorities and stack might be a section of the comprehensive rules that would be good for you to read over because mm -hmm. those are something that a little bit more understanding about that would yeah. be good well, yeah i mean and also the basic, like, the thing is, the comprehensive rules, while they're not really meant to be read as a thing, they're, like, organized to be referenced, basically. They're not made to, you know, you don't read them like a book. But yeah. the thing is, they are still set up in such a way that the more fundamental things are covered early, like, the, the absolute basics of the game are covered Oh, like, let me just pop into the comprehensive rules here. Um, but, like, yeah, I mean, it starts with game concepts, then goes to parts of a card, then card types, then zones, then turn structure, then spells and effects, and then everything else afterwards so like it, it starts you know from the fundamentals and builds from there because you need to know what you know a card is or what a counter is before you can start doing stuff with those right? yeah yeah so it so, so even if it, even if it's a bit dense of a document it's still set up in a way where it does build on itself it doesn't just throw you in the deep end which is good uh yeah. so i think that's a good way of looking at like magic and i would say yeah probably go a lot the same way for any collectible card game you have i know some of yep. them have much simpler rules and then you might be able to just actually reference the entire rule book but yeah. then it's it's dependent on the game too uh oh yeah exactly for well, like the... mm, go ahead well like the thing is magic has such complicated rules because it's a very complicated game like it's not yeah like most other card games, trading card games, whatever, they have very defined, um, you know, very de more, much more constricted and defined, you know, rules. Like most, a lot of card games, a lot of deck building games, you just can't do anything on someone else's turn. Like, you just, you play your turn, then they play their turn, then you play your turn, and you just don't interact except by things you do on your turn, you know? Yeah. Right, and yeah. the longevity of the game. I mean, lots yeah. of things have been added over the years. Well, yeah, and again, also the the rules had to be made so that they matched what a bunch of older cards did. Because, like, back in 1999 with 6th edition, the Magic rules had a huge overhaul. Like, they're 
they're they completely changed the way you know casting and resolving spells worked and you know everything everything like you know it went from a weird system of batches and interrupts and all sorts of nonsense to you know having the stack and you know a more reasonable priority system and that's a pretty big change and they they have to be able to account for that yep and i don't know like the thing is sorry i've kind of lost where i was going with this but yeah <laughs> yeah no no i i could sort of understand where you're going with this it's the fact that the rules have altered so much and um and that we have to respect that they have to pertain to all the cards that have been yeah. put out uh exactly for things like a card game or a board game, I mean, usually you would have maybe one person read through the rules and play through it. But the fact is, like, even after that first play, read through the rules yourself some point in time. Oh, yeah, even exactly. In between there. Because you want to get an idea, and that person might have missed something. And the same... Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, no, something I, I thought of when you initially read, it, read the question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, the thing is... You, you want to make sure you're actually playing the game as intended because if you just learn from someone else who learned from someone else who learned from someone else and no one actually goes and reads the rule book you end up with this situation like uh like for example with monopoly like a lot of people really really hate monopoly because it never ends and blah 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 but the thing is their monopoly games never end because they're not playing by the actual yeah. They're playing with weird things like putting money on free parking or not auctioning properties that people don't buy and all this stuff that's like actual core rules that no one ever reads, right? Like, if you actually read the Monopoly rules, the games go pretty quick, like, and they're pretty brutal. But no one reads those rules because everyone just knows how to play Monopoly, right? Yeah. Like, yep. yeah. And I think the same could also be said for, like, for role-playing games, too is that you might know some basics from observing people, but try to read through at least, like, I would say for any party out there who's trying to learn the rules for that, other than character creation, read yeah. through combat. You don't have to really yeah. look into any other sections, but as soon as you read through combat, you're going to have all the basics that you're going to need to know about for most oh, yeah. role-playing game systems. So, so yeah, like, of course. there are these levels for each of the rules that I really recommend you dive into, to know about them and it will require some reading i can't deny that but it will help you in the long run because you know that's i think that's our all of our advice here is it'll help you in the long run because you'll know the rules better and you you won't face mistakes as much as you would if you did not know them right yeah yeah so that's our that's our sage advice question which i think actually ended up being a really great one uh, even though I probably expressed it terribly because I'm always really bad at expressing these questions that are in my brain. <laughs> As I think last week, Joe, you gave me like, you summarized what I was trying to say like perfectly. And I'm like, I was thinking that and I <laughs> wouldn't say it. <laughs> because I know how your brain works. Uh, you've hung around with me long enough to do that. Yes. But we're a little early, but that's not a terrible thing. We're still doing pretty good. I think we're... That's going to be it for today. This has been a great one. Uh, yeah. I think we've had a great time. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, for being on here. Yeah, Do you have anything you. you want to promote uh, for you, self here? Um, just my. If anyone wants to ask me more questions or whatever, my main the main place I do that is on Tumblr. It's just magicjudge.tumblr.com. All one, one, no spaces, one word. Um, I'm Jackal Girl on. Twitter, JQL girl. Um, you got you can link this all in the in the yep. chat. But yeah, I mean that's basically where to find me. I'm online all, too much of the time, <laughs> and yeah, that's I mean that's about it. Uh, just stay curious, respect your judges, don't be afraid of them. Go play some magic, have fun next weekend at uh, Hour of Devastation pre-release. Yes, I we'll have to see if uh me or, I'll be able to make it or not. I don't know. I, I was yeah. considering it, but uh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things. Uh, anyway, Joe, uh, I guess you just have your normal thing of promoting me, don't you? Yep, same thing. Uh, see you guys again next week. Uh, same, time, same time, same channel. Uh, and um, then see you tomorrow yes. for Treasure of the Lost Legion. Uh, you got it right this time. 
Yes, I did. That's why I paused because I'm like, I'm going to say Legends. It's not Legends. <laughs> uh, we're planning for four o'clock tomorrow, but be advised, it probably won't be me this time delaying it. But one of our players might be a little late, so we might be starting a little later than four o'clock tomorrow for Treasure of the Lost Legion. Uh, I would say no later than five, though, from the information I've been given. But it's not me for once. Dun dun dun! I know. Usually it's me that's causing problems for our scheduling. <laughs> bad DM, bad. Uh, and also, I'll probably have more gaming streams. As you've seen, I have threw a bunch of gaming streams up there in the course of the week. So may I'll try to announce longer ahead of time if I end up having just one that I'm doing with people or something like that extra beyond the normal gaming schedule for streams. Just so people know. Uh, I will try to do that. And I'll be on Twitter, I will announce that. Uh, and remember, if you want to support uh, more of the show, you can always follow us here. You can always go over to my YouTube, follow there. The VOD will be up uh, later on this week. I usually get it up Tuesday or Wednesday. I try to aim up to get this episode up during the week. Uh, and uh, as always, if you guys want to show some really great support, uh, there is always, I do have a Patreon, which is linked down below to support the channel and all this stuff that we do. Up to you however you want to support it. But the more support you guys give us out there, the better it is. And the more of these uh, shows I can throw out there. So, uh, you know, the more love we share between us all. Which is always good. And always play some great tabletop games. Bam. All right, And everybody. maybe if you pay him enough, he won't say grand perks anymore. God damn it. Is that, that, can that be like a Patreon goal? It's like, I correct my language, finally. <laughs> correct my language, finally. God. No, no. Definitely. Pay to have it tattooed on his hand. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope everybody had a great time. We'll see you here next week. And I hope everybody has a great weekend. Bye. Bye.